Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. It has been a significant week for green hydrogen in South Africa. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss developments. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. South Africa hosted a green hydrogen summit this week. What was announced? Yeah, it was a big event, uh, post-COVID event, lots of in-person plus some hybrid aspects. A uh, lot of enthusiasm around green hydrogen at the moment and a lot of enthusiasm for South Africa as a destination to build uh, green hydrogen production, which would be based on renewable energy, large-scale renewable energy investments, electrolyzers that split water into oxygen and hydrogen. So that's really what we're looking at. And the world demand for that is expected to rise dramatically over the next uh, 30 to 40 years as countries seek to decarbonize, take fossil fuels out of their system. And there's some addition, additional impetus around this now because of what's happening uh, between Russia and Ukraine following the invasion. Um, there's a, a huge reliance on Russian gas in a number of countries. And those countries are now looking to try and accelerate the green hydrogen uh, initiatives and build markets, build pipelines. And, and that creates an opportunity for those countries that have good resources for renewable energy, and South Africa is one of those, to competitively produce a hard green hydrogen and, and generally convert those into some sort of derivative tradable product. And ammonia is, green ammonia is the big one, green methanol is another one, green steel is a, is a big uh, opportunity as well. So South Africa, what was announced is that we've got this green hydrogen strategy uh, that we want to be a that we've now included a number of projects, nine projects in total, as strategic integrated projects. Now, theoretically, strategic integrated projects under the um, Infrastructure Act uh, should receive sort of priority or preference in terms of getting through the approval processes. We know that South Africa's approval processes are notoriously difficult to navigate and water use licenses, land authorizations, all those take very long. And what these and environmental authorization, what being a SIP enables is to do concurrent uh, uh, approvals rather than sequential, and to do these within a, in a, a time frame that's shortened. So it's a significant development. And these nine projects uh, are spread around the country, but mostly look to tap that uh, incredible uh, solar resource uh, that we have in the Northern Cape. But obviously, getting closer to markets, we want to be close to ports. So places like Saldana Bay, Buhu Bay as a potential hydrogen hub, which is not a, a real port yet, but there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, then into the eastern Cape, Kuka has got plans. In South Africa, we've also got, uh, we're used to using grey hydrogen on a large scale. And uh, we've got probably ready-made markets that use grey hydrogen, most notably Sassel. Sassel also confirmed that it is pressing ahead with its plans. Yes, Sassel's wanting to become a major player in green hydrogen. It's, it's a sort of existential crisis that they're in. They're a very carbon heavy business. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on them to have firm plans for decarbonisation. Uh, that at the moment, the, the initial plans, they, they, they describe them as really being financially prudent. Uh, some would see them as ultra conservative, but they are moving ahead uh, in a very really sort of measured by way around green hydrogen, with most of the activity they're saying really uh, going to be taking place post 2030. But the early stage of that uh, is around uh, bringing in renewable energy into their systems. Um, and, you know, they've got a sort of a clustered approach, is what they, they're sort of pursuing for green hydrogen. So in partnership with ArcelorMittal in the Val Triangle, they're looking at a lot of green steel, also carbon capture and utilization opportunities around the Fondabao plant, uh, that's the ArcelorMittal steel plant. They're also looking at opportunities to produce green hydrogen and then feed that into the steel mill down in Saldana Bay, which is currently mothballed, which can use that rather than coal to produce uh, hot briquetted iron that can either be used to make steel or can be used to export as a hot briquetted iron to get into the, the electric arc furnaces that are already in place in Europe that are looking to decarbonize. So there's, there's that opportunity. But 
really the big, big opportunity for Sassel is they've got an installed base of Fisher Trop technology, which is the largest in the world. And what that has traditionally done is taken grey hydrogen that's been gasified using coal, which is a very carbon intensive process. And rather to try and progressively convert from grey hydrogen to green hydrogen. So there's an there's a initial project called High Shift, which they're doing in partnership, which is building into a very important global platform called H2 Global, which is a German government. It's a tool or a mechanism that sort of uh, it's a, it's, it subsidizes the green hydrogen in a form of sort of secure offtake at a premium, it seems. So it's a, an interesting mechanism because there's definitely a first mover disadvantage here. As we've seen with renewable energy, when Germany went ahead, the electricity went, was very high. Electricity price went very high as a result because they, they, they created the market. Then there were massive technology cost learnings. And in that process, now we, we are the beneficiaries. So now when we build solar and wind plants, because of what peop countries like Germany and Denmark did, uh, it, uh, they took, took that on the chin. We are the beneficiary of those learnings, and we now know that the cheapest electricity is now from solar, PV, and from onshore wind, which is really because of that sort of pioneering market development work subsidies that they put in their system. And that's the same sort of model that they're using through this H2 Global with hydrogen. They'll create secure demand for these higher priced products, it seems. So they're bidding into that, <coughs> and then Sassel will look to have a, about 450 megawatts of solar uh, and then electrolyzer capacity around that and then build, have about 1% of that plant being based on green hydrogen rather than grey hydrogen and, and convert that into uh, sustainable aviation fuel and sell that into an aviation market that's desperate to find a carbon neutral fuel, which is what it would be. So that's the, the plan and I think that's the sort of big opportunity that we've got a domestic base of grey hydrogen or demand for grey hydrogen that we can progressively convert to green hydrogen. It's a ready-made market and uh, it will be capital light relative to other countries that will have to do the downstream investment to produce the sustainable aviation fuel. Sassel already produces a certified sustainable aviation fuel using hydrogen. But the issue is now not to have a grey hydrogen, which is highly carbon intensive, to have a green hydrogen. Cabinet has approved the green hydrogen commercialization strategy for public comment. Yes, that was this week as well. And that's important because we've had really a science-led type uh, approach to uh, green hydrogen. We've actually been a leader in terms of thought leadership around this. Um, and the science that's been really led by the Department of Science and Innovation for many years and we've been developing and it's really been focusing on fuel cell end, the sort of the, the, the other side of the market, the demand side of the market, because fuel cells consume uh, platinum group metals and it creates a new market for, for those precious metals. As the vehicle fleet moves away from internal combustion energy e uh, engines, one of them will be fuel cell electric. We know about battery electric, there's lots of battery electric but there could be fuel, a number of fuel cell electric vehicles coming in uh, to the market, mostly probably in those hard to abate mobility sectors. So railways, uh, long haul trucking, with the battery electric market being much more passenger, lighter vehicle focused. I think it's going to be dominated by battery electric there. So that was really the initial business case. You know, how do we create a new market for platinum group metals? I think it's now turning on its head and we say well actually our biggest resource is our solar and wind competitive advantages and how do we upstream of that create this commodity this very valuable commodity called green hydrogen and that's where the strategy is focusing now so it's been put out we haven't seen it yet it's been approved by cabinet to be put out for public comment and uh, that should happen quite soon and there'll be a comment period and a toing and froing and then the, po the, the, the strategy will be finalized. In parallel, obviously, we've got the Just Energy Transition Investment Plan, uh, the 1.5 trillion sort of investment plan that was, uh, that was approved just before 
by Cabinet just before COP27. That's also out for public comment, and we should see start seeing some action around that between now and February. So we'll have these two uh, parallel processes going on, because within the Just Energy Transition uh, Plan, there is a, a green hydrogen component. It's not the main component, the biggest component, which is the most important component for South Africa now, is the electricity component, especially getting the transmission grid fit for purpose or fit for the future, which is a much larger grid so that we can feed in this renewable electricity at the lowest possible cost and use it mostly uh, uh, for electricity. But more and more, we've got an opportunity to also uh, produce green hydrogen. And around these green hydrogen clusters is going to be massive amount of electricity, green electricity that's going to have to be built. And the virtue in this, the symbiotic relation as, a, as an electricity short country is you have to overbuild, a bit like what you have to do in the electricity sector as well. But you, the electrolyzer, to make it as efficient as possible, and that's the big if and but in the whole green hydrogen, can we bring down the cost, electrolyzer cost and make it run as efficiently as possible? You need to have more electricity available uh, than the, the, the size of the electrolyzer. And the virtue of that is there'll be more electrons for the rest of us, uh, which will help stabilize the grid. But uh, the, the focus of obviously the, the Just Energy Transition Strategy is to get as much electricity investment going as possible and to use the concessional finance to do that. But we also have this green hydrogen element and now with this commercialization strategy also in the mix. So I think it has been a, a big week for green hydrogen and an important week. But we have to start moving from concept and as people say from memorandum of understanding to final investment decisions. We need to also find mechanisms that we know there's first mover disadvantages and we need to find those mechanisms that can help us in a very fiscally constrained environment. And fortunately, there are global initiatives that can have you help us maybe close that gap like the H2 Global. And I think we need to get our ducks in a row that we can really take advantage of that so that we can have the technology cost, the learnings and bring down the cost of electrolyzers to a point where it can really be competitive. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.